Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Julie Cox said we like to be punctual. So it is 1230 and we're going to start this afternoon's um, webinar on lumbar spine disc herniation with Dr. Cox. Obviously a favorite, um, certainly solidified Cox techniques place in manipulation and it that has evolved over the years to be able to treat many conditions of back pain, but this is certainly a favorite. So um, Dr. Cox is going to do this webinar this afternoon. If you have any questions, use your question panel, type them in there and I will bring up questions um, with him as appropriate either throughout the webinar at the end. And also the notes are in your attendee panel under the term handout. So there's one there you can download. And if you forget that, I can always send that to you later. So this afternoon, we are all also going to use the force table. So when he goes to the hands-on demonstration, we'll do that transition to the force table. And um, I'll have you set so you can watch him do that. So without any other issues, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Cox and you may change slides on your own. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for studying with me today on a subject that um, is probably the most predominant condition you and I see as clinicians, low back with or without radicular pain. The first slide is the protocols of using a Cox distraction technique in the treatment of lumbar disc herniations. I'd always like to begin with slides that show the importance of what we're talking about. And this technique is done by Honifer and Bill Reed, who's now at the University of Alabama as a neurophysiologist. And this was published in 2015, um, studying low velocity variable amplitude Cox technique. In fact, in this article, uh, you will notice that they actually term it Cox technique. And the result of this paper was that the administration of the technique that you and I are about to study gave remote anti nociceptive effects similar to clinical findings. So we can see that, that placing spines under a distraction mode with protocol one definitely has an anesthesia effect on low back and radicular pain. This was a paper done by Onifer and Reed et al. and the evidence-based complementary and alternative medicine in 2015. I'd like you to note that neuropathic pain was addressed, pain that radiates to the legs, a common component of low back and chemical inflammatory changes of the dorsal root ganglion. When you read a paper like this, and I'd like you to note in the third from the bottom line, this was Cox distraction that they were using, that the neuropathic pain, a very common finding that you and I see as clinicians, that one month of flexion produced greater analgesia in chronic bow back patients who had leg pain as compared to no treatment. So here is the model of the technique that was used. It was done on the large Worcester rat at Palmer College of Chiropractic. And this is the instrument. At the top, you'll note the typical Cox instrument that you and I use in doing distraction spinal manipulation. We then built this table at the University of Iowa, 1 12th the size of the real Cox instrument. And this is what you see here, using the large Worcester rat to apply low velocity variable amplitude technique, which is what the universities today call Cox technique. So you're going to see us doing this today on a human. I want you to remember the work of Chow, published in uh, Musculoskeletal Science Practice in 2017. You can read all of this about MRI studies of participants on the real-time effect of distraction on lumbar intervertebral discs. Now I'd like you to note, in conclusion, that horizontal traction was evidently effective in increasing the disc height in lower lumbar levels. Now, those of you who are familiar with our federally funded studies that we did at Loyola Medical School, Heinz VA Hospital, National and Palmer, with input from 
University of Illinois, you remember that one of the things we documented with the work you're going to do with me today was the increase in what? Intervertebral disc height. And then Jun wrote in this paper, Chiropractic Manual Therapy, a year ago, that from the articles, there are seven themes identified that happen when you apply spinal manipulation with a positive clinical outcome. Number one, the themes are there's a change in muscle activity. We know from the work of, of uh, Wong and Kauchuk, right, that there definitely is strengthening of the multifidi up to seven days following a single spinal manipulation. We increase range of motion, we decrease pain, we increase in the pressure pain threshold, we lower the point at which pain is instituted, we change the tissue behavior, and we change the central nervous system in what we call afferentation. That is, the substantia gelatinosa interpretation by the lateral spinal thalamic tract and the posterior tracts of gall and burdock to the somatosensory cortex of the brain into the pyramidal system, forming the cortical spinal tracts and endorphin production in response. You remember from the work that we did at Loyola Medical School in the Heinz VA, National and Palmer, the five things that happen when we go to the instrument, I'd ask you to visualize and sense in between your brain and your hand, the things that you have documented that are happening in the human spine when we do distraction Cox technique. Number one, as you just saw, other literature like Chow, there's an increase in the disc space height. We drop the intradiscal pressure from a positive 25 millimeter to a centripetal negative force of up to 192 millimeters of mercury. We increase pyramidal area by how much? 28%. We restore, we maximize physiological range of motion, all of which results in the positive afferentation. Incidentally, I'd like to make you know that April 17 and 18 will be the thoracic spine conference here in Fort Wayne. And at that, I will do a two hour lecture on afferentation Doctor, I'm sure that you know from your study that afferentation will represent today at least 50% of the beneficial outcomes of Cox spinal manipulation. In fact, I believe all types of manipulation. I urge you to attend that um, with Dr. Kurt Holding and Dr. George Joachim. It will be a day of um, the most recent research in spinal manipulation for you to carry home and all five of these changes that take place under your hand and your mind in treating patients will be presented. And then I'd like to ask you, what are the things that must happen when you and I treat a spine in order for the patient to show a positive outcome that is relief of two things, pain and disability, when you and I perform a spinal manipulation, in this case, Cox technique. Number one, Wong wrote, and all of these papers are referenced for you. Wong says you must increase the physiological range of motion, which he said was what? Reducing spine stiffness. Number two, as Kochek showed, the multifidi. You must show strengthening of muscles. Three, and Biotti has written four papers that I have, I'll present in Fort Wayne, that one of the things that is a must in a patient who shows a positive outcome from a single spinal manipulation is increase in imbibition of fluids into the nucleus through the end plate from the cancerous vertebral body of the vertebra. This is shown through what? Diffusion weighted imaging, anistrophy, and apparent diffusion changes within the disc when you and I apply this technique. And remember the work of Cool. This paper showed that when you and I distract a vertebral joint, what happens? Well, we enhance the nutrition supply. That's why all of us use Discat Enhanced. This is pernicatoliculus, the highest source 
of glycosaminoglycan within the disc on Earth today. It's called chondroitin sulfate. And when we do this, we think of KUO, about the imbibition of nutrition, which promotes cell proliferation of what? Degenerated discs. Keep that in mind as we treat. Finally, the work of Chung, published in the famous radiology journal, who showed in real time that when you and I do this technique, the following things happen within the triple joint complex of the disc. We separate the disc space. We change the shape of the disc. We reduce intervertebral disc protrusion. We separate the disc and the adjoining nerve roots through the osseoligomentous canal, and we widen the faucet joint space. As osteopathic literature says, what do we do? We stretch tissues. That's really what this is all about. That is what creates everything from increasing a disc space to stimulating the somatosensory cortex of the brain. Before we move to technique, I would urge you to remember two things, please. The intervertebral disc is the most painful tissue in a low back. Okay. The work of who? Kuslich Orthopedic Clinics in North America, volume 22.2. So when a disc degenerates, what happens? Well, this dorsal root ganglion will sprout sympathetic nerves into the disc as deep as the nucleus pulposus of the disc. So with disc degeneration, potentially, the disc becomes more and more what? Vulnerable to pain with less and less irritation. Second thing I'd like you to note is that the DRG is three times larger than the combination of the dorsal and the ventral root combined. You and I serve to decompress the dorsal root ganglion. Keep that in mind. Then I just want you to, to just remember and put this in your mind as you touch a spine, or at least I try to do that. This is an L5-S1 disc. This is the exiting of the S1 nerve root. I'd urge you to note that the space between these nerve roots is from seven to 10 millimeters. That's why a large central disc can cause alternating or bilateral radicular S1 dermatome pain. The L4-5 disc compresses what? The L5 nerve. Here comes the L5 nerve posterior laterally through the osseoligamentous canal. Remember, we used to call this what? the intervertebral foramen, it passes through here. So just keep in mind, L4-5 disc herniations, compress L5 nerve, L5-S1, L5 nerve. One big, huge exception <laughs> is a far lateral L5 disc herniation with a free fragment, which there is no way that any physician can escape seeing this. An L5-S1 sequestered disc compressing the exiting L5 nerve root. How do you diagnose a straight leg raise? Instead of raising the leg and flex at the hip, the entire pelvis rises from the table. Please remember this picture as we move to the instrument in clinical rounds. I'd ask you also remember this slide taken from Clinical Biomechanics of the Spine by Manahar Punjabi and um, uh, Augustus White from Yale and Harvard. When you and I distract, never, never, never contact the spinous process below a medial disc. If you do, you're going to pull the nerve into the disc and you're going to feel worse. If it's a lateral disc, okay, because whatever we do, we're pulling the nerve away from the disc and they are better with distraction. Those of you who arbitrarily without knowing this, put people on an instrument that just pulls them apart. Sometimes that distraction can be protein, good for you here, but it can be venomous here. Got it? Remember one thing also about necking of the disc. This is the research done by Ram Gudavali. I don't claim to have his genius about biomechanics. That's why he's the head of our research. But here is pixelized disc material. 
I'd like you to note that here's an intervertebral disc before distraction. And Ram did this actually with our studies at Loyola and National and Heinz VA Hospital. Watch what happens to this disc when we distract. It's called necking, necking. You see how the disc recedes? As you apply a distractive force to the annular fibers of the disc, it creates a, a centripetal force, which causes this necking, the tautening of the annular fibers to pull back discal herniation. Remember, all these things as we move to the instrument, viscous disc bulge or necking versus the force. Remember here, as we apply more force, we also get greater posterior decompression of the nerve root and what? the DRG. So let us move to the instrument. Let's apply textbooks that you and I just looked at. And I would urge you to read this book three times. It's, I don't know whether I know anything or not, but I put what I did know into this textbook. I urge you to read it three times. I still read it because I forget some of this research. But when you look at this spine and we move to the instrument to treat it, this book will give you the foundation, the very basis of doing Cox distraction technique. Incidentally, all royalties from this book go for spine research at this stage to the Kaiser University College of Chiropractic Medicine. We look here at advanced L4-5 disc degeneration with a slight degenerative spondylolisthesis, small disc bulge, but now a huge L5-S1 disc protrusion at L5-S1, where we make our contact L4. I'm not gonna contact five, the chance of driving a nerve root into this disc. Contact four, even three, in order to reduce this disc herniation. When you and I look at this on the MRI, what do we see? Disc bulge with high intensity zones, as described so well by Michael Modick, the hemispherical sclotic change of the L4, L4 and L5 vertebral end plates, the disc herniation here, which is huge. That's huge. Here's the right S1 nerve, right? The left one is embedded within a sequester, protruding L5, S1 disc fragment. So we will move and we will treat this condition I'm going to do it with a contact on the L4 spinous. I'm going to share with you how we suggest you approach this from a force application from two to eight pounds per segment. Let's go to the instrument now and put this knowledge into our hands. And there you go, Dr. Cox. So when we treat this condition, we're going to contact L4 because we have degenerative stenosis at the L4-5 level and a large left-sided L5-S1 disc prolapse. We always treat bladder meridians B22 to B35, B49 to B54. So deep multifities. If you look, these are really deep multifities. Iliocostalis, lumbodorsal Fascia, so we just goad these with a fairly firm compression. Prior to distraction, we move to the posterior retrochocanteric fossa. We call this the Goic syndrome, right? The Jumelli obturator internus complex, the Jumelli inferior, Jumelli superior, obturator internus, and the large pyroformis muscle inserting here. So we treat these acupressure points. When we treat this case, I urge you to begin with very low force. In other words, I'd almost summarize from, from the clinical outcomes that whatever is the lowest force that gives a positive outcome is the force that we should use. So V of V, if I start with manual distraction, that is I'm going to release the flexion extension of the lever, I'm going to set the tension on the instrument so that the instrument does all the work for me. 
I'm going to start up here in the upper lumbar spine intolerance test. Hold the strap down to a taut point at about one to two inches of force. Now if you look at the graph and you look at the far right, you'll see that I'm starting here at about 13 pounds and going to 15 pounds. So I'm applying about two pounds of tolerance testing per segment. And I move from L1, 2, 3, 4, and you can see the sine wave showing my force application. And I move all the way down to L4, which is where I'm going to apply the treatment of this particular condition of L4 degenerative stenosis and an acute L5-S1 disc prolapse. I tolerance test. Rarely will a patient say at two pounds of tolerance testing that they feel anything. What do they typically say? No, doc, it just feels good to be pulled apart. The lowest force that gives clinical relief is where we start, and if it works, you don't have to go any heavier. If I contact now the L4 spinous process, and in treating, I'm going to apply an equal cephalid force at the L4 spinous, and an equal caudad force with the tiller bar, it's going to look like this if you watch the graph. I start here at 10 pounds, I move to the taut point. You can see the blue line rise. That's a taut point. We call that the barrier of elastic resistance. And under my hand, I just felt a facet release. That's always good. But when I get that taut point, let's begin again, please. I'm using two pounds of force, my colleague. Contact L4, taut point, and you see the rise to the top point, a very elastic resistance. Now I apply distraction of two pounds. And watch the graph change. You see how it's a small graph. I'm going there from 15 to 17 pounds. I'm going two pounds. You see the graph. The light blue line is my pressure on the spinous. The dark blue line is the application of the distraction force. And if I go a little more, I'm going to go to, say, four pounds. Please observe the height of the sine wave. Now I go four pounds, and you see that the sine wave increases, showing that I'm now applying four pounds. Doctor, for me, this force will handle my patients. Now let's say that I were to move higher to say L1 because I say I hit thoracal lumbar degenerative disc disease. Now you'll know that the higher I go the more force I must use because I'm distracting several motion segments. But I move to the taut point so if I'm going all the way up to L2 you'll notice that I'm using here if you read the second from the right I'm using seven eight pounds of distraction and you'll note the smooth, rhythmical oscillation of protocol one in the treatment of spinal stenosis, in this case due to lumbar disc herniation. I would like to take you from the manual application of this treatment to the automated distraction. Automated distraction is a much stronger force than is manual application. So we always begin treatment with a manual technique, which we just observed, so that we can tolerance test the patient. We can say, does this cause you any discomfort? And we can thereby adapt our force to the patient response. At the point at which a patient is 30 to 40 percent relieved, I will lock the instrument at the flexion angle of comfort to my patient and institute automated distraction. If you will note, when I apply automated contact on the L4 spinous process, I want you to notice how much greater the pounds of force are. Please observe.
you can see that the sine wave rises quite a bit. I'm going here from 9 to almost 20 pounds. So I've increased my force by about three times over 6 pounds of force. And when you do this, you're asking the patient, are you okay? Does this cause you any discomfort? If you have started manually and you've gotten residual centralization of the sciatic radicular component above the knee, you can go to automated. When you do it, however, very slow, very gentle, realizing that we're applying much more distraction with the automated force than we are manually. For example, here, if I start here at 2, I'm going almost at 20, I'm applying much more force manually, or uh, automated than I am manually. I hope that you follow that. The patient will show relief with more force, but first make sure that you have manually started, that you have applied from two up to eight pounds, and then move to automated distraction. So let me just review, finally, contact L4. I start out manually at two pounds, taut point, two pounds, then as the patient tolerates that, I'll move to, to four pounds, four pounds. Then I'll move to six pounds. You okay, Rick? Mm -hmm. All right. I always ask patients. Now here's eight pounds. And note the height of the sine wave now. The patient will tell you that's quite a bit more force. Okay, that's eight pounds of distraction force. Then when I move to automated, patients responding, centralization of the radicular component, contact four, and I begin automated distraction, and you'll note, it's a very smooth, consistent force, but one wants to build up to this with careful tolerance testing of the patient. My intent in studying with you today is to share with you the gentleness of the technique, how you build up to a higher force, and that if a lower force is getting your patient well, so be it. I don't believe there's anyone sharing and studying with me today who doesn't see these patients every day. They represent a great challenge, but when ad uh, addressed with this technique, with careful tolerance testing, well served. Frankly, I could never do well with these people in a side posture lumbar roll. Perhaps there's a reason that that's the greatest cause of malpractice in chiropractic today. I treat all disc herniations, all spinal stenosis, acute disc, which is the goal of today's lesson. I hope that you will implement this, that you will see if it benefits your patients and thereby make the decision as to whether this is something that in your erudite opinion will help your patients. I'm ready for questions. Okay, if anyone has questions, you are welcome to enter those in here now. I don't see any at the moment. But I do also want to add what Dr. Cox just mentioned is that we invite you to come to a seminar and actually use the force table. That's a great learning tool. So we want to invite you to that. Um, for the moment, um, the next webinar, we're going to do cervical spine disc on April 21st and thoracic disc on May 5th. That'll be a follow-up to our April 17-18 courses coming up. If you're interested in more on the disc herniation treatment and Cox Technique, please visit all of our CE courses online, coxtechnique.digitalchalk.com. Check the textbook. Like I said, I use that index every day and answering emails and questions. Uh, we've got hands-on workshops we're starting up again in, in certified doctor's offices. We have online CE courses and our seminars. Um, we're going to do two live ones here in the next few weeks here in Fort Wayne, and we'll introduce the new extremity sport rehab course in the fall. Um, the Force Tables by Haven Innovation. Um, 
please give Amanda a call if you have any questions on there. It's available as a force table or one without, um, whichever way you want. And we certainly welcome you to visit all of our outlets. Yes, I maintain all of those crazy outlets, but we have lots of information online. So, um, yes, and then you've got a question, so we'll go right ahead. Um, this is a new edition of low back and leg pain, what it is and how it is treated. This little book describes, for example, levels of disc herniation, the ridiculous component that accompanies each disc, which helps you and I in diagnosing the level and the treatment. As you know, sometimes we are actually treating ridiculous pain, not based on an MRI finding, but on what? A clinical diagnosis. That's called choosing wisely and maybe. Um, but this book describes for example, the case we just treated. It shows what a disc herniation is. It shows the sciatica that accompanies it. We talk about the treatment of the intervertebral disc and the 50% rule, that 50% relief, we're moving on to a stronger distraction force and physiological ranges of motion called protocol of two. We also discussed with the patient, the set syndrome, short leg, transitional segment, vertebral subluxation, Spondylolisthesis, both true and degenerative, sacroiliac subluxation, tropism, scoliosis, transitional vertebra, spinal stenosis, and the treatment of the pregnant female. In the back is the treatment that we did. It, it describes what it is, and then we give them their homework about don't sit, hot and cold, hunting's effect, the avoiding constipation, taking discan. We put all of these people on three of these in the morning and three at night for three months and then cut that in hand. This is to stop inflammation, help regenerate white fiber cartilage. We also will use in acute discs, we will use curcumin, turmeric root as an anti-inflammatory agent for the treatment of disc herniation. In other words, we did not the intent of this seminar today. But you know that interleukin-6, interleukin-1b, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-4 are also produced in the dorsal root ganglion and the intervertebral disc as T1 cell pro-inflammatory cytokines. That's why we use this to lower the inflammatory exudate that accompanies nuclear disc degeneration and fragmentation into the canal. So this book, show it to patients so they understand their problem, the physics of why we practice as we do to help them. If I don't do this, my people didn't understand the problem and they thought they should be well in one visit. So got two questions. Good. good. Dr. Boulian, he says he just got his force table today and is excited to start using it. So yeah, that's good. good. And then I have a question, Dr. Cox, would you ever stop with the flexion distraction treatment? on a patient due to their improvement once they're better? That's an excellent question. Every time a patient attains 50% relief, we are changing them from what? Active treatment to an active treatment. All through this, we are putting the patient on exercises. We teach them ergonomics. Now, let me take, that's a great question. Because as we are treating this patient, as explained in this book, there are exercises that they will do. And these exercises will include those that drop intradiscal pressure, increase range of motion, drop and increase the foraminal area. But at the same time that we are doing these exercises, we are teaching the person ergonomics, how to bend and lift this taught in this book. And we also, in people over 50 and sometimes much younger, what are the other problems we have? Balance. There's no one who's going to have a disc degeneration or disc herniation who at some point in their life will not notice balance issues. Therefore, as a part of our program, and this fits your question, do you ever shift? from the passive treatment to the active treatment. That really is the whole goal, isn't it? It's to teach people to stand on one foot and then the other foot, to do tandem walk, 
to practice ergonomics, the sit the stand. I want my patient to be able within 12 seconds to go from sitting to standing in 12 seconds. If you don't think that's difficult, just ask your patients to do it. So we want them to do sit the stand. We want walking tests in which they can sit, stand, walk 14 feet, come back and sit down in less than 12 seconds. So, oh yes, to your question. Not only are we doing distraction reduction of the spinal stenosis, regardless of the etiology of the stenosis, whether it be in this case today, a disc herniation, ligamentum plowing thickening, faucet arthrosis, in plate hypertrophy, a combination of the above as we reduce pain. Now follow this point. As we reduce pain and disability, we increase their, their, their active care at home. And that brings the question, at what point do we begin the, the active care? And what is a minimal clinical improvement? 30% in all of medicine, whoever you read, if you give a patient 30% relief, that meant that that treatment was worthwhile. Our goal has always been what? 50%. Doctor, do you know that there are papers today that even showing 10 to 20% means it was worth doing the technique? What is the number to treat? How many people do you have to treat to help one? Well, this number has been documented at two. For every two you treat, you help one. Well, what is that number to treat for, say, high blood pressure pills? It's in the hundreds. What about? Cholesterol lowering drugs, and I'm not here to, to talk about drugs, but this work, our constant effort is to decrease the number to treat, to increase the minimal clinical improvement, to shift the patient from passive to active care as quickly as possible. I trust that I partially answered that question. I think the other thing you might want to add is um, when the patient can come back, you kind of leave it up to them when they oh. want to come back. No, not anymore. Doctor, are you are you familiar with the research study out of Europe within the last three months that actually showed that maintenance care, I don't care whether you call it data or supportive care or whatever, ongoing care, actually gives people more relief and less expenditure than them waiting to come back when the pain returns. I tell my patients this when we've gotten good relief. They can avoid doc, I'm really doing good. Or I explained to him, I hope you know that your ability to walk to the mailbox and back is a great clinical improvement. But when we reach the patient's goal, and I always ask them, what are you looking for in relief? Once we obtain that relief, I say this to them, we can really do one of two things now. We can stop all care and wait for it to return and we'll start all over again. Or you can come in to me at periodic treatments by three, four weeks. Let's set up the treatment plan that maintains your relief and then follow that. And at the same time, we're talking nutrition. These people are on discat, chondroitine sulfate. They're taking curcumin until relief of at least 50% relief of radicular component and back pain. They're taking vitamin B12, 11, 9. Why? because we want to convert homocysteine into what? Methionine. We want to convert ADP into ATP at the my, mitochondrial level. Oh. We can have Dr. Cox go all afternoon yeah, on this, yeah. but we are done with our tips. Um, I think those are it for now. So you got him excited and we went a little long, but that's all good. Um, if you have any other questions, email me later. Otherwise, check our websites. We're going to do cervical spine on our next webinar. And um, thank you for being interactive, asking questions. Have a great afternoon in practice. And thank you, Dr. Cox. Thank you.